Buenos Dias Tactical Edge. Um, that is half of the Spanish that I feel that I'm qualified to speak. I don't want to massacre uh, your language any more than I need to. Um, I want to say thank you very much. This is my second time in Colombia, and I've come to really uh, love Colombia. Uh, the hospitality that we received from everyone here has been fantastic, so thank you, thank you very much. What I wanted to talk about today is the security operations. Not as a technical guy, because I'm not anymore. Um, but how I see, in, over time, we're, we're, we feel sometimes we're, we're fighting a losing battle. And what I want to talk about is a path forward that I think over the next 10 to 15 years is where we end up. All right. I will just do it this way then. It's okay. So. I'm not, I, I'm a CISO. I've been in doing information security for a really long time. I don't own a company. I'm not part of a startup. Uh, I'm a blue team defender, probably like a lot of you, or you help blue team defenders. We are the salt of the earth when it comes to doing security. I know at a lot of conferences, it's really sexy to see the, the, the pen testers and the hackers and the red team guys show you how they break everything. I'm a builder, not a breaker. And I'm willing to bet most of you are builders, not breakers. But even as builders, we know just from experience that what we've been doing over the last five years has become less and less effective. So with that in mind, a little bit about me. I work at Northside Hospital in Atlanta, Georgia. We have about 14,000 employees. We treat about 1.4 million uh, patients a year. And one of the things that we're very proud of at Northside is in our women's center, in our main hospital, uh, we deliver 29,000 infants a year, more than any other hospital in the United States. It's something we're very proud of and something that we take very special responsibility for. Because some of these babies are very, very sick and are in our neonatal intensive care unit. And I've been talking with some of the folks here. In a neonatal intensive care unit, in the bassinet, there are 47 different devices attached to an infant that can weigh less than one kilo. So but my team is very involved in that. We take it very seriously. Uh, as Ed mentioned, I do host the Southern Fry Security Podcast. Uh, my friends over at the Defensive Security Podcast, we're both in Atlanta. We constantly harass each other. Uh, it's two different kinds of podcasts, and it's only in English. I hope those of you who, who want to can subscribe to that. Um, I have served in the United States Army as an armor and cavalry officer. That heavily informs how I think about information security. And I've spoken in a bunch of different places. I've, I've been to uh, ShmooCon in 2012. I was in Kali at Security Zone and a, in, in a variety of B-sides events in the US. I want to do the right button. Okay. The fundamental, my, my posit is the fundamental way that we do security operations hasn't really changed. If you think about it, the last really disruptive technology that we had was the Stateville Firewall. Maybe IPS. Um, for those of you who've been around for a while, we, we had IDS, and the first time we flipped on IPS, what happened? You know, bad things happened. The challenge is that right now, we have a lot of vendors that are trying to sell us old technologies repackaged. You know, if you think about things like endpoint detection and response and machine learning and artificial intelligence and next generation anything, it's simply incremental changes and incremental advances in the things that we've already done. It's been a very evolutionary thing, not a revolutionary thing. So why do we need this radical change? Why is it important? The accelerated growth of the threats and vulnerabilities that we see out in the environment is frightening. Um, so let me show you this. I downloaded the entire CVE database from MITRE, and this is just every year what happened. So as you can tell, in 2008, along with all of us who were around during the economic crisis, the bad guys took a break too. But if you normalize this out, the, 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 the rate of growth into reported vulnerabilities, you know, and discounting the unreported, has been astronomical. And there's no real way 
that we're ever gonna, that we can realistically say this is going to get better anytime soon. If you look, and this is a little bit older data, if you look at this, this is the average, the annual number of data breaches and the number of exposed records. So the number of breaches is going up, the number of records is hovering, but the value of those records is changing. Now I think 2017 is gonna be radically different, mostly because of another Atlanta company called Equifax that has come up a couple times in a few talks. But we're seeing massive breaches of really important data and we don't know how to stop it. The other big challenge, and, and let me ask, how many of you guys, how many y'all are in charge of a security program? You have people who work for you doing operational security. There's, there's some, okay? So, I would submit to you, there's no feasible way, there's no real way we're going to hire and train and retain enough qualified people to fix the problems doing it the way we do now. It's just not possible. I sit with CISOs in the Atlanta area and throughout the United States. One of the major topics that always comes up is I can't hire people. And when I hire them and train them, the company down the street offers them 20% more a year and they steal them away. And now I've got to go hire someone else again. So I know this can't just be me. I'm assuming it's also some of y'all. It happens. It's real. And it's a problem that we have to deal with. So my, my proposition is that automation, including fully autonomous security platforms, and we'll talk more about what that means, I think is the only feasible answer to our mid to long term security problems. So let that sink in for a second is fully autonomous means a lot of things. Especially like we talked about, the people, when we went from IDS to IPS, I remember uh, it, I was a, uh, a senior engineer when we got some IDS equipment and it had the IPS and we clicked the switch um, and that's what happened to the security crew. Because we started blocking CEO's stuff, we started blocking the chief marketing officer stuff and in two and a half hours, we turned it back off and my boss got fired, right? And if you think about it, IPS was the first time we really looked to automation to make choices for us and enforce rules. In the first several years of IPS, if you were around, we were terrified to turn it on. It's gotten much better, right? IPS is now one of the key security controls that we all use, but that's what happened. So why do we need to change and why do we need to do it now? Change is hard, especially revolutionary change. A lot of times when you come to a conference like this or you have a salesperson visit you, they wanna, they wanna get really excited about an incremental change. And there can be value to that. There can be a lot of value to that. But what I'm, what I'm proposing today is whatever value's there is not as great as the value that you need to start thinking about over the longer term. A whole bunch of incremental change does not lead to revolutionary change. So, automation. There are three stages of automation. Um, stage one, you are the machine. Stage two, you build the machine. And stage three, you build the machine that builds the machine. So let's, let's kind of visualize what that looks like. In 90 plus percent of security shops, our analysts and our engineers are the machine. They have technologies like antivirus, firewall, IPS. They're getting consoles, they're looking at logs, and they're doing the best job they can, right? The problem is that if you try to scale this problem up, your people start working in a cube like that. It doesn't work, it looks really cool, right? But it doesn't work. Um, there, I've seen studies that say, if you've got more than three monitors on your desk, you're wasting money on monitors because you're not actually looking at them. So this doesn't scale. So we go to the next stage. You build the machine. And this usually happens when you've added some more source systems. You know, maybe like, you know, email logs are coming in, uh, files from your web proxy are coming in, and you send it to a sim. Um, this is where most enterprises are right now. I have a sim at the hospital, and we're, it does a lot for us. It's a wonderful technology. I'm not saying bad things about sim technology. But the challenge is with sim, sim will tell you when it thinks a bad thing is happening, but it's still relying on a person to do something about it in most cases. 
So what happens is you have a whole lot of data and it can be rendered in some really interesting ways. We get these visualizations that, you know, in my, in my world called pew-pew maps, right? And you get to watch the missiles going back and forth between the cities. And, you know, in security operations centers, there's always one screen that has this going. Everyone who works in the SOC knows that it's worthless, but it impresses management and customers, right? We've all been there. I'm not saying this is bad. The data is good but it still takes people to act on the events that are being correlated. So then you build the machine that builds the machine. And at you know, Northside, we're kind of moving this direction. You add some more um, feeds. Uh, is Taz here? Okay, threat intel feeds, yeah, and she's gonna beat me up for talking about threat intel this way later, right? But th you get the, the, the threat intel feed, you get the user behavior analytics feed. Now so much data is coming in that your SIM can't handle the number of logs that are coming in. For those of you who've never worked around SIM technology, the pricing model is the more events you send, the higher the cost. So you work really hard to only send the events that can be correlated. So, but all, that other, all those other logs are really important when an event happens. Uh, we're using the phrase enrichment data uh, at, at the hospital. So you create a data lake, right? you know, using big data and Hadoop and Kafka and all those other wonderful buzzwords that big data people like to use. But then when you build the machine that builds the machine, those two systems are sending the data to an autonomous security platform. So the problem <laughs> and the challenge is when you start talking, and I've had numerous conversations with folks, um, what does an autonomous security platform look like in your cube? And some people believe it turns out to be Skynet, right? Um, where the computers, our computer overlords take over and we are out of jobs and bad things really happen. I reject that utterly. So, but seriously, what's in this box that I'm calling the autonomous security platform? What is it? And I'm here to tell you that right now in our world, in cybersecurity, it doesn't exist yet. The thing is, and we'll talk about it in a minute, it does exist elsewhere. But let me talk about why the autonomous platform is important and where it plays in the cycle of security life. For those of you who've been in security operations, this is uh, a friend of mine you know, taught me the phrase, the hamster wheel of pain, where you, you, if you ham have a hamster on the running wheel, they can run and run and run and run and run, but it's constantly a circle. So we monitor, we watch for things that happen, we detect problems, we validate that it's a real problem because false positives are a thing, we then respond to the, to the thing, we remediate, and we just can't say we're done because we have to go back and monitor again. This is the cycle of SecOps life. Um, the reason I don't do SecOps anymore is I can't do this, but I have some people who work for me who love this. The challenge is that it's about time. When you do validate, respond, and remediate, you have an analyst or an engineer or multiple analysts and engineers who are sifting through logs, gathering up data, making decisions about what to do. And the problem is human beings are wonderful. We're the strongest computers in the world. But when it comes to this, we're not fast. And even the best engineers and the best analysts we have take time. And the problem is the adversary is iterating faster than our people have a chance to think. So what do you do? You have to start thinking about context. What drives that time, what makes the analyst's job difficult, is they have to pull in many more logs to figure out exactly what happened, and when it happened, where is it, what is it doing, and based on what we do, for example, at a hospital, if I've got two things going on and one impacts biomedical devices where a patient could be harmed or one is simply stealing data, I focus on the thing where a person could get hurt. You can steal all my medical records, leave my clinical devices alone. But the problem is that when you have analysts and engineers who've been around a while, they accumulate what we call tribal knowledge. They have information in their head that no matter how good your documentation regime is and how much you try to build use cases in whatever um, management system you got, there are things that they know because they've been there for so long. You break out of that cycle. You have to take the analyst completely out of the picture. 
We can't have human beings there anymore. Now, when I tested this conversation with my SOC analysts, they looked at me like that, <laughs> right? Because they're worried. If you take me out of the picture, what am I going to do, right? And, and I'm a little older, and I, I'm a little more calm about these things. But when you're talking about people who, who still have a whole lot of student loans to pay from their university degree, this worries them. We'll talk more about how you talk about your staff about it. I want to talk about how this has been done, done elsewhere. Um, like I said, I'm, an, I'm a former Army officer, so it's very rare for an Army officer to brag about anything the United States Navy has done. It just doesn't happen. But the Navy has done something extremely interesting if we look at it from a slightly different angle. And the system is called Aegis. Aegis was developed and deployed, was developed in the mid-1970s. Um, it was deployed on USS Ticonderoga on, in 1981 and aboard the USS Arleigh Burke uh, in 1991. It is a very complex set of systems that takes inputs from radar, sonar, um, intelligence updates that are being digitally sent to the vessel, alerts that are being generated through all the spaces of the vessel, and then it, it can control all of the weapons aboard the vessel. Everything from the deck gun to the Gatling gun to the missiles that are on board. And it's very, very good at what it does. This was demonstrated in 1988 in the Persian Gulf. USS Vincennes, which was a uh, Ticonderoga class cruiser, detected an aircraft approaching it. The crew aboard determined from watching a whole bunch of different consoles, they thought it was an Iranian F-14 that was on an attack path to launch a missile at them. And they fired a, a surface-to-air missile and shot down a Iranian Airlines um, Boeing aircraft killing almost 300 people. At the same time, Aegis was looking at all the data, and Aegis was saying, this is an airliner, don't shoot. But the captain of his sends made the decision to overrule um, Aegis, and a very horrible thing happened. Now, if you think about Aegis and the time frames this happened, and I'm looking at this group, and a bunch of you probably don't remember the 1980s if you were even born in the 1980s. This is old technology. The first deployment of Aegis used Windows NT version 3.51, right? It's also horribly expensive. The diagram here is what the Combat Information Center aboard a Ticonderoga cruiser looks like. Labor is one of the most expensive things we do. How many chairs are there? A bunch, staffed 24 seven. Aegis is expensive. It's not fully autonomous yet. And it's not because it can't be. It's because the US Navy hasn't determined under the laws of war, what happens when a robot shoots something down? And let's say they shot the wrong thing down. Who's responsible? It's an important legal question, but that's for another day. But I, I would tell you that this is what can be done with old technology. Aegis ran on Windows NT 4.0 until 2002, right? This, is, this can be done. So a lot of folks, when I talk about this, well, that's the US Navy. They have an infinite amount of money. They have an infinite amount of people. That's not, you know, businesses, commercial businesses can't do this. Well, I think you're wrong. For a short period of time, I worked in the hedge fund industry where they do high frequency trading. And in the United States, there are computer systems that are located as close as possible to a, a internet network access point. Because in this world, milliseconds of latency count, and vast amounts of money trade hands in um, trades that are comp computed by algorithm. It happens so fast, no human being can possibly validate it. They only know when the algorithms have gone wrong is when the stock market can dump 22% of its value in seven and a half minutes, which has happened. Um, this happens today. Up to 50% of the trades on the New York Stock Exchange are done this way every single day, trillions of dollars. So saying that a commercial enterprise can't create these kind of systems, you can if you want to. 
and I'm telling you that we're going to want to soon. So we have to pick a path. And as information security professionals, the door we pick will either have a great job or it's got a lion behind it, right? So let me tell you about the door you want to pick. What makes automation work? First, you got to start with a really good understanding of the business process of your business. Not the security aspect, but how does your business work? You have to be really confident in how you define the responses that you want the security platform to take. And this is the scary one for a lot of people. You have to be willing to take risk. So, complete understanding of the business process. Just that? That's easy, right? Um, I spent 13 years working at Delta Airlines. I understand more than probably most information security people how airlines work. Do I have a complete understanding of the business process? No, I do not. The business probably doesn't know the entire business process. If you've worked with businesses and you're trying to understand from a security perspective, how do you make money? You probably have to talk to six or seven different people to really understand from the point that they're out there prospecting for a customer to where the money is deposited in the bank, all the different things that have to happen and all the different decisions that have to be made. The way you do this, the way you accomplish this, is most large organizations, and I'm talking about large organizations here, they are continually doing business process re-engineering. There's an industry that does this. If you leverage that, if you take advantage of it, or in my case, co-opt it completely, this is where you got not only get to know what the processes are, you get to inform and influence them. But also remember, this is a process without end. This is a different hamster wheel of pain. Because as the business is growing and as your business is evolving, processes change. As I look in, in, in Latin America, Latin America is growing so fast. If you think back to 10 years ago, how business was done in Latin America, I'm be willing to bet it's radically changed in 10 years. That's okay, that's fantastic. That's where economic growth comes from. But you have to be able to defend what's happening today, not what was happening 10 years ago. So how do, you, how do you get there? You need to learn the business of your business. You have to stay connected to your business partners. One of the things a lot of uh, information security people don't do is they don't establish relationships with the people in the business. We like to stay in our locked room with our pew pew map and never talk to them until they click a link they shouldn't. Then we go out there and we beat them on the head. Right? And Mr. Callot's gonna talk a little bit about that later today. You have to document everything. Taz was exactly right about this. You have to document what you're doing. Tribal knowledge is the enemy. And you have to validate and update. Validate and update. As Cervantes said, to be prepared is half the victory. It's truth. You also have, have to have confidence in defining the responses. You have to have an incredible amount of transparency with your stakeholders as you develop responses. You, know, you need to be able to go to the head of marketing and say, if these four things happen uh, on our, on our e-commerce website, we're going to shut it off. Are you okay with that? And they, you need to make sure they make a fully informed business decision and then go with it. If you test and you validate, this will keep you from failing hard. You will fail. You wanna fail forward in that wonderful expression but you're gonna have problems. But if you test and validate before you put into production, that's how you prevent yourself from really failing hard. And this is one of my maxims of life. Start small, iterate larger. Too many times in InfoSec what we do is we try to deploy with a big bang. This usually happens with technologies like DLP, where we put in what we think the rules are supposed to be and we flip a switch and just like IPS, we're blocking the CEO from getting his emails or sending his emails to the company that they're trying to buy. And then someone comes down screaming and you flip DLP off and you never turn it on again. But if you start small and build rules and learn the environment and grow and grow and grow, you can deploy DLP. This is how I've done it at my hospital. And most importantly, if you, if you remember nothing else from this talk, this is the thing to remember. Always, always, always have a manual back out or back up. I've seen people lose their jobs because they flip the switch of the thing they're really proud that they built and they forgot one thing 
and they blew up the, the business process and no one had any idea how to recover. You don't want to be that person. That is a, a friend told me, it's a highly emotional event when that happens. You have to have a willingness to take risks. But if you understand the processes, you should be able to reasonably define responses, especially if you're talking with the people that you're about to inflict the process on. And you can overcome their objections, because let's face it, the people we talk to in the business are afraid of us. They are afraid we are going to break their thing. We're going to break the way they make money. We're going to break the way they serve customers. They are afraid of us. And for a lot of years, rightfully so. But if you work with them, you can overcome their objections because they're helping define what the answers are. And um, again, I'm an armor officer. George S. Patton Jr. is one of my heroes. And his, his, one of his best quotes is, take calculated risks. This is very different from being rash. And I really hope that translates well. So what have we learned today? Automation is going to be it. I mean, and again, we're talking large enterprises 10 to 15 years out because this automation is going to be expensive. But like every other expensive security technology, it starts moving down market really, really quickly. It starts with the Fortune 100, then it becomes a Fortune 500, then a Fortune 1000, and then most large companies around the world can afford to do this. You really have to understand how your organization works. If you as a security professional don't understand your organization and you attempt to do this, at best you will only lose your job, at worst you will put your company out of business. And that's not what we're here to do. Also remember, this is not a risk-free endeavor. Um, but if you, the risk, the residual risk that we leave by not doing this, I, I would tell you over time, is going to be existential. Companies, large companies, that have large exposures to the internet. If they don't do this in the next 10 to 15, as this technology comes available in the next 10 to 15 years, it's an existential problem for them. Because the, as you remember, as we're advancing and getting faster, the adversaries are advancing even faster. And the commoditization of attacker tools is getting larger and better and faster than we've ever, ever thought it could. So, muchas gracias for being here today. What I'd like to offer is, uh, when we're done here, I'll be sitting in the booth area in the um, uh, conference little corner there. If you'd like to come up, ask questions, or if you want to tell me that I'm completely wrong, I would love to talk to you. Um, if you don't speak English, and I don't speak much Spanish, uh, Senor Rojas has, has agreed to be there to help translate and make sure we can talk. And if you'd like to give me a business card, I will send you a copy of this presentation, and I'd be glad to you know, engage with you as I can. So, Again, muchas gracias, and uh, have a wonderful day.